Welcome to Rework, a podcast by 37 Signals about the better way to work and run your business. I'm Kimberly Rhodes, and I'm joined by the co-founders of 37 Signals and the authors of Rework, Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. In their book, Rework, there is an essay called Strangers at a Cocktail Party. And Jason and David write, quote, hire a ton of people rapidly and strangers at a cocktail party problem is exactly what you'll end up with. Jason, do you want to explain what does this even mean? Well, I got to admit, we don't have a lot of experience with this, really. I mean, we, we over the past few years, we did hire a lot of people, uh, way more than we've ever hired before. But we've never hired, let's say, 100 people in a month, like some companies, or, or 500 or 1,000 in a year. You know, So some different scales here. But in general, I think what happens is when you hire too many people at once, there's, there's a balance thing that you lose. You begin to find this imbalance where you have this set of people who understand the the norms, the values of the company, the sort of the society of the company. And then if that's over, if, if, the, if, if, if the, the scale tips too much, um, you can actually lose the continuity of what you're all about. Uh, and, you know, it's not that like maybe, maybe it's time, maybe things should change at a company, but I think there's a lot of value in the continuity of, of an approach in general. So uh, a lot of this has to also do with individual projects. If you put too many new people on something that's important and don't have like a veteran presence on that, they're not going to, again, going to be able to continue the, the sensibilities, the ideas, the degree of quality, the, the, the feel of something that already existed in the past. And you do want to have something that's continuous, I think. So that's kind of one of the really, in my mind, the biggest issue uh, with, with bringing on too many people too quickly is that you actually have an assimilation issue. It's kind of really what it is. Uh, and... You know, that can be good. It's usually not so good, though, I think. Uh, and it creates a lot of turmoil. And then the company doesn't really know who they are anymore and where to go next. And people don't know who to, who to lean on and what, what, what's, what value is important and what isn't. So I think that's the thing you got to keep, keep in mind here is that uh, assimilation is important in an organization, in a society. And um, too, is, too much at once uh, creates a major imbalance and a very difficult situation for uh, continuity to, um, to, be, to exist. And that comes because culture is implicit. Culture is not written down to the largest degree. We write a lot down. We share more about our culture in terms of how we view the world and who's in it and what's important than almost anyone. And yet still, to really get what it's like working at 37 Signals and making the decisions in the spirit of what we're doing, the continuity, you have to work with someone who's already been here. You have to work with others who've absorbed all of that in all its implicit forms because it, it's not all written down. You can't just read one book and then understand at sort of a deep core internalized level what it actually means to make the decisions this kind of way. And I think the recognition that culture is implicit is difficult and perhaps frustrating even for a lot of people to understand because like why can't we just write it down if we could just write it down wouldn't it be much easier if we could write it down wouldn't explicit be better i've come to appreciate i mean we again write a lot down we do believe in explicitness we do believe in recording these sorts of things but it's not the full picture and it shouldn't be it misses a lot of the texture a lot of the humanity of oh, what is this culture? What is going on here? It's actually about the people. If you look at the technical organization at 37 Signals, the culture that we have is a lot about what would, what would Jeff do in this situation? If we're changing Queen Bee in this way, what are the sort of steps that he would make sure that like, we make something that's right, that it goes out and billing doesn't stop? Oh, we have a really tricky issue where we got to dive into the database. What would Jeremy do in this case? Oh, he... These kind of things, like it becomes, it not just becomes, it is, culture is very personality focused. And it is very much an apprenticeship. You're learning the culture by learning from the people who are in it and from specific individuals. And you're not going to write that down in that style. So I do think that making sure the dilution factor is gradual and over time is the best way to ensure that. Now, at the same time, Jason already hinted to it, sometimes you might need to make a big cultural change. We've done one of those within the last few years, and that did require a massive dilution because you were actually trying to not just reset but reject 
some of the stuff that had gotten into the culture. And that's not easy to do, and sometimes that does require an influx. But when, you ha when what you have is working, and sometimes that's on like, oh, it's working on this one parameter and it's not working on the other parameter. On the parameter where it is working, don't dilute it too much too fast. Um, on the th stuff that's not working, I mean, you might very well want to go like, all right, we, we should actually pour it all out, and then we can pour it back in and we can start fresh. Um, but um, yeah, actually, can it's I really add about like, are you looking to change it or not? It's, it, you'll often hear the statement like, we need some new blood around here. Like that, that, is, yes. that is a symptom of like, we're stuck. We're stuck in our ways. We're maybe slowing down. We're not really pushing anything anymore. We need some new blood, some fresh blood, some youth, but not necessarily even age, just like new. You need new. And so that's a case where, where you actually want to upset the apple cart and you want to you want to flush in a lot of new things uh, and to flush out some of the old approaches or to challenge them or to, or to push them off balance at least and then see where the new thing settles out. So there are times when that's super important, critical in fact. I mean, I, I think our, our company, I don't think we would have survived, frankly, had we not made had the big shakeup a few years ago. Um, or we would, have, we would have turned into something that basically... Uh, you know, David and I would have would have probably moved on, and who knows where it would have gone from there. Not that we're the only ones that matter here, but like we led the place for a long time, we wouldn't have wanted to stay here. And at that point, who knows what happens? So there's a good chance that things would have been incredibly different, not for the better. So we had we had to, you know, some people choose to let, ch ch chose to leave, others were sort of. Um, uh, there's an opportunity to leave and they want to leave for other reasons. And so is it just a good moment to open the doors wide and then open the doors wide again and have a new group come in and sort of reset the culture for us and reset our, our direction? That should, of course, be happening every year. I mean, like that's that that's the problem. You can't have that happening or every month. Um, but yeah, you know, once in the course of 20 years or a decade or 10 years or five years or whatever, maybe, maybe that's pretty valuable, but it shouldn't be the steady state. Which is the gift of crisis that that's an opportunity where you can make large changes that you would not make when everything is just going, I was going to say honky-dory, but like just like sideways. Like, eh, it's sort of fine. It's actually quite difficult to change a culture. And a lot of companies, when you look at them from the outside, it is quote-unquote obvious that something needed to change. But the catalyst that allowed that change to actually happen is usually a crisis. And if you look at some of the famous downfalls of major companies like, I don't know, Kodak or BlackBerry or Nokia or any of these other companies, you can, you can zoom out and go like, yeah, do you know what? It was pretty obvious a while back that things needed to fundamentally change. But it was actually impossible for that change to happen because the crisis didn't show up soon enough. If they had only been so blessed as to have a crisis earlier in the transgression here of history, they could have done something about it. It's very difficult to change a cult culture fundamentally without a crisis. But I'll also say that we used to put a higher, mm, I was about to say status, that's not right, a higher value on longevity and seniority and tenure at this company to a degree that I think actually looking back tipped over. And that's not even talking about crisis. It's not even talking about resetting the culture in the big way that we did a few years back. It's talking about the challenging of existing ideas and paradigms and approaches that you get when someone enters the organization with fresh eyes. And if you both want a company that's not growing crazy, and is trying not to become huge, does not treat small like a stepping stone, and you value someone who's been at the company for a very long time, you can end up a little stuffy. And I think, ideologically speaking or approach speaking, I think we did end up a little stuffy in that regard, where you just look solely, oh, it's wonderful that someone has been here for 10 years. Of course it is. That's a major achievement. But if literally everyone has been here for 10 years, there's also a blind spot. And there's also... A, a real, I mean, it's a little bit of a macabre thing, but like the new blood thing, I think is actually accurate, right? You need actually some new antibodies. You need some new flow. You need some new different things, not necessarily to overwhelm, but just like as a continuous refreshment. Um, I think of sometimes this, this concept like donating blood. What happens when you donate blood? You go in and you give, I don't even know what the quantity is, like a pint. Um, and then you your body will develop a new pint 
to to go with that. And you're like, that's that. I have no idea how medically accurate any of that stuff is. But like, I like the metaphor of this idea that like, do you know what? Occasionally I get rid of a pint and then a new one is, is generated and that's healthy in and of itself. And then I think there's a specific tactic to do this. And historically we didn't do that well. I don't know. That was the circumstance. We would hire like one person. Oh, let's just find one individual and we're going to plop in. It's actually harder in a lot of ways to hire one person than it is to hire two. When you hire two people, first of all, they're starting with a buddy, someone else who's in their boat and situation and level of experience with the organization. And that's really helpful for their finding their way in the organization. Uh, I mean, Kimberly, you started at the same time as uh, Chad. Yes, and I think my day one there's been buddy. a lot of positives about that, right? And then I also think actually when, when you're doing it in a certain group, like let's say you hire three programmers, it makes the evaluation of progress much easier. Because when you have three individuals who start at the same, with the same premise, you can actually compare. That's not that you have to stack rank people, but if someone is dropped in and like they pick things up and they get on with it well, they show all the promise and all the things are, are good. It becomes harder to excuse the person who after six months still sort of haven't gotten it. If you just only have that individual and after six months, they kind of sort of still haven't gotten it. There's a million excuses. You can keep going, oh, we should have done more mentoring. We should have done this. If we had just written more of it down, if we'd done this, if we'd done that, it would have been different. Hawk. Here's another counter example to that. Someone else walked in with the same premise. They were able to make it work. So I think on both sides of the equation, it's better for the person starting to have someone to start with, and it's better for the organization to be able to look at multiple people who've started in the same role. Okay, so this essay is talking about not hiring too quickly. So I'm curious about kind of the timeline that 37 Signals has had in terms of its size, like starting out to where we are 25 years later, was that two employees at a time over the course of time? Was there a peak of the number of employees to where we are now? Kind of talk me through that. We usually just hire, we historically hired one at a time, this idea of hire when it hurts. So there might be a deficiency somewhere in one group and we needed one more person, something like that. So it was very slow, very, very slow to start. I think we hovered around eight for a number of years, maybe 10, 12 for a number of years. Then we had these sort of uh, explosions, these Cambrian explosions, perhaps like where we had, we hired 10, I think, I forget what year it was, but when we hired, I think Jeff and a bunch of people, it was like 10 people came 2012. on. 2012. Was it 2012? We hired like, I don't know, 10 yeah. people, something like that. It's a big year. Um, why? I don't really know. I don't remember exactly. I mean, 2012 was around BC2, um, actually BC... Yeah. Um, so, I, yes. I, yeah, BC2, because it was eight years after B Classic really launched, basically. So, but I don't know. Um, there's times when that happens. But the steady state for us is, is, is one to a few. Um, and right now, we're like, we're looking for one programmer um, right now. Um, I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't, I, I couldn't say this confidently, but if we found two outstanding programmers, maybe we would hire both. I don't know. Um, we're probably going to look for another designer soon sometime at this point this year. Um, and if there was two outstanding designers, perhaps. But w right now, uh, we're, we're just kind of growing again back to maybe one at a time, depending on, on what department we're hiring for. Um, I think for customer service, we've hired multiple people at once uh, in the past. Sometimes it's because we're trying to cover multiple time zones. There's a bunch of different circumstances at play here. Um, but um, we've sort of gone in this sort of step function sort of thing and sometimes big jumps oftentimes pretty plateau-y, small, and then big jumps, that sort of thing. And then again, a few years ago, we hired, gosh, I don't even know, we had like 30 people in, was it two years? We hired, I think actually almost Was it 40, 40 people? people? Wow. From Close to 40. 2021 to... 23, like maybe. Early 23 yeah. or something? Yeah. Like over the course wow. of a year plus, it was like 30, 40 people. Yeah. Like that was... That was a lot. And it sort of kind of, some of it didn't work, right? I think that's fair to say, as in um, when you hire that many, the odds, the stats just are that some of it is not going to work out. And we had also, 
it wasn't just like we're going to hire to replace people who are no longer here. It was also we're going to try a bunch of new things, and we literally just tried all of it at once. Oh, maybe we should have an inside in-house counsel. Maybe we should have our own full-time lawyer. Like maybe that's important to this extent, or maybe we should have this person. Maybe we should have that person. And we realized in some cases it wasn't about whether the individual was right or not right. It was that the role wasn't right. So we kind of piled a lot of things on top of each other, both sort of, um, all right, we need these people, and then also like, oh, I wonder what that would look like. It was really a period of experimentation on that dimension that we'd actually never done before at that scale. Um, and I think not all, not all of it was successful. Of course it wasn't. I mean, it'd be amazing if everything we tried just out the gate was <laughs> successful. Not all of it was uh, successful. And then being able to unwind is actually the thing I'm, I'm most pleased about, that for the things that did not work, we were able to say like, you know what? We're not gonna do this forever. It did not, this particular thing, like let's just take the, the in-house uh, legal counsel. We just didn't need that. We didn't have 40 hours a week of legal matters to be addressed. And as we've talked about in the past, one of the very dangerous things is to hire someone full-time when the job isn't. If there's 10 hours of work, actual work that needed to be done, but you can only hire in 40 hour bulks, you're gonna end up with like 30 hours of spare capacity, which very quickly turns into negative, right? You will do more work than what is not just required, but is good, and you will start detracting from it. And I think um, that's something to be on the lookout for. But yeah, that was a wild experiment. And it was a wild experiment that happened on the back of a crisis that allowed us to do something as dramatic as that. We would never have done anything at that scale in that way if it had not been because we had to, for starters. So I really like that experience, actually, in terms of its overall ability to challenge our premise and our preconceptions about how the business should run. Um, I think one of the books where just even the title made a huge influence of me was um, the book, The Half-Life of Truths. This idea that there are all these scientific truths that essentially expire, that they expire because we develop better knowledge, better insight, better truths. And then the thing you knew from 10 years ago is no longer true. And I think if you've been in business like we have for over 20 years, undoubtedly we will have taken all these positions about like, oh, you shouldn't do this or you should totally do that. And they're no longer true. They were true in 20, uh, uh, 2006. They were true in 2012, not true in 2024. How are you going to find out unless you try? How are you going to find out unless you push it? I mean, I actually think of sometimes if you see that uh, video with the Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics, where they try to push the robot over, they even use a stick to do it. Think of the organization at that, as that Atlas robot, right? Try to push the organization sometimes. Like it should, not all the time, it, I mean, but occasionally you gotta, you gotta push at it. Is it good? Is it resilient? Can it take a step back? Can it take a step forward? What can it do if you put it under a little bit of pressure? And then again, Sometimes you're granted this pressure for free because crises have a way of showing up at your doorstep uninvited. But when they do, great. Everything's great. Invited in a crisis, awesome. Total success, awesome. Uh, Flatline for a while, awesome. All of the outcomes are awesome if you choose to make them so. Okay, I know you guys hate these kind of questions, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, 40 employees in like this two-year period seems like a lot for the size the company is now. If you had to do it again now, would you have hired 40 employees? Well, my answer is you, you can't do it. You, you would have done the exact same thing <laughs> that you did. I knew you were gonna <laughs> That's just, you're, you, all the atoms in the universe are arranged in a certain way at that moment, you're gonna do the same kind of thing that, that you would have done. Because we had, a, we had an idea at that point to, to become a more capable company. This was not just about like, can we hire more people? We had like an idea that surrounded it and we were filling in that idea. Um, and we had this idea that we needed in-house counsel for X, Y, and Z reasons. Like we, all the reasons were there. So we would have done the same thing. Um, but what here we are today, we've backed off of that. We're smaller today than we were a year ago. So, um, but I, I don't think we did the wrong thing back then. I think we did the right thing back then, doing what we were like needed to do at the time. And then I think we did the right thing again by saying, you know what, 
some of these positions don't make sense or some of these people haven't worked out for whatever reason and we made some changes. So I don't know, that, that's my answer. I, I just don't think you can redo any of these things. I mean, you, I, not that I don't think you cannot redo them. I just think you end up in the same situation again is that, you know, the, the situation was what it was. Um, the idea that you had was what it was and you were going to fill in to make it work. So that's my, it's not really fatalism. It's just and even like more truth. fundamentally, yeah. I, I don't want a smooth road. I don't want to know all the things. I don't want to avoid all the mistakes. Half the excitement and joy of running a company is to encounter novel situations or even crises mm -hmm. and having to fix them without knowing what the right answer is. <laughs> this is where all of the novel, like, all right, now I got to figure something out and I don't know what the right answer is. I would absolutely hate to be robbed of those opportunities, not have any crisis or have all the foresight. This is probably one of the reasons why, um, I mean, you should never say never, but I don't think I have another company in me in terms of like the, a company like this, because I don't want to go back into the early days and knowing everything that I know. I, that sounds awful to me to know everything about everything I needed to avoid. No, I like the novelty of experiencing the world for the first time, experiencing all the challenges for the first time. Now, there's some irony in this is like, isn't the definition of wisdom and experience is that you've seen things and you're able to preempt them? Yes, it is. But there's also just a youthful exuberance and excitement in seeing problems for the first time. This is one of the reasons whenever I talk to young entrepreneurs and they're always, or not always, some of them are anxious about all the things they don't know. Oh, well, should we have a board? Like, what if there's a bunch of wise people who can come in and tell us like what we're supposed to do? And I'm like, no, you, you don't want that. You want the adventure. The adventure is the payoff for doing all this hard work. The adventure, the uncertainty, the fresh novel challenge that you have to figure out from first principles. And you can't just look up the answer at the back of a book. That's the, that's the, that's the good thing. That's literally the essence of it. That's what's going to be left. When you're done with the whole thing and you sit in your rocking chair with your little uh, blanket and a cat or something <laughs> looking at the sunset, you're going to think back upon that. That's going to be the treasure that's left over. Remember when we didn't know the things and we did them anyway and what happened. No one is going to look back and think like, oh, remember the time when we knew everything exactly what we were supposed to do and we did it and it worked out? There's literally not a memory in that account. Your brain will not just successfully, but happily erase all of that. It'll just flush it out. There will be nothing left and it'll just be a blank slate. Everything that fills up those core memories, everything that like, you're gonna retain for your rocking chair days is gonna be in the quote unquote hardship. And I don't actually mean hardship in terms of like the hero myth of entrepreneurship, but just in the difficult decisions you had to face and had to overcome, and then the prize afterwards is, is the memory. Like, don't, don't take that away. Don't even get into the frame that it's valuable to take that away. Embrace the opposite. Embrace amor fati. You're gonna love your faith, you're gonna love the path exactly how it is, and you will want nothing to be different. You want all the hardship, heartbreak, difficulty, exactly as it appeared. Last question before we wrap up, David, do you have a rocking chair or a cat? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I actually have two cats now, and I don't have a rocking chair, but I have a sun recliner that I now sit on for like 20 minutes at least in the morning and just like go like, oh, feel the sun. And I, that's where I know I'm like getting old because that concept that like I was just going to sit on like a thing and like be appreciative of the sun, like that was not a concept I had in my 20s, I'll tell you that. The way you know if you're getting Excellent. old is when you get out of the chair, you go, ooh. That's how you know. <laughs> if, you, if it feels yeah. harder to get out of the chair than you thought it should, that's how you're getting old. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Rework is a production of 37 Signals. You can find show notes and transcripts on our website at 37signals.com slash podcast. Show notes and, oh, just kidding. Full video episodes are on Twitter and YouTube. And if you have a specific question for Jason or David about a better way to work, leave us a voicemail at 708-628-7850. You can also send us an email at rework at 37signals.com. How many times have I done that outro and I still mess it up? <laughs>